Howdy. So we're going to keep talking about uh, these things that are sort of crystals, uh, and we're going to start talking about quasi-crystals. And we're going to pick up with a challenge question, and that is to identify in this particular tiled structure, what is the highest order rotational axis that we can find? And so this is a, you know, it seems like a relatively organized structure. Um, uh, mathematicians call these Penrose tiles. So you take two different tiles, these blue diamonds and a slightly different shaped uh, called the green diamonds. And it turns out that you can pack these together and you can fill up all of space. Uh, and you could pack it in a relatively organized, coherent way. Um, and if you look very carefully, right at the center of this pattern, we have this um, five-pointed star. Uh, and it turns out that there is a five-fold rotational axis right in the middle here. Um, so if I look at any one point here, uh, I could rotate once, twice, three times, four times, and five times, and be back to the original position. So if you're paying attention, you already know something kind of weird is going on here. Because when we talked about allowable rotation axes in two-dimensional or three-dimensional crystal lattices, we specifically said that we can have two-fold axes, so the symbol is an ellipse. We can have three-fold rotational axes, that's supposed to be a triangle. We can have four-fold rotational axes, the symbol is a square. Um, and we can have six-fold rotational axes, with my little hexagon here. Um, but we cannot have five-fold or seven-fold or any other um, kind of a rotation axis. Uh, and yet, I've just pointed to a, you know, uh, a pattern uh, that seems to be pretty well organized that has a five-fold rotational axis right in the middle of it. So what's going on here? And the first clue that something weird is going on is that if you try and identify a lattice vector or a unit cell uh, in this pattern. And so let's say the center of this five-fold star uh, is a lattice point. You know, maybe I could try and go out to the center of this star, but it's not quite the same because uh, this first star is ringed entirely with these blue tiles. Uh, and this one, that ring only goes part of the way around. So this is not going to be the same chemical surroundings as our original point. Maybe I could try going out here, but again, I don't have this ring of blue tiles all the way around it. Um, and, and you can try and find, you can try every single other, you know, little five-fold star, but none of them look quite like this star in the middle. Um, and so what we have here is we have a, a arrangement of tiles that has symmetry. There is a five-fold rotational axis, but it has no translational periodicity. And that means there's no lattice vector that's bringing us from one lattice point to another lattice point where those lattice points have identical chemical surroundings. Um, one way to think about this is this is a macroscopic manifestation of a point group, right? When we talk about point groups, we have a, um, a symmetry element uh, that's passing through the origin, some paint in space. And so in this case, we, we have that five-fold rotational axis that's, that's passing through a point. Um, but there's no uh, periodic translational lattice. And so traditionally, um, you know, this would not have been called a crystal because crystals... Um, as we talked about when we were talking about 2D and 3D crystal lattices, crystals are supposed to have unit cells, these basic building blocks, um, and have lattice vectors that, you know, we can translate one unit cell to another space and another space uh, and fill up all of, all of space by translating that one pattern. That's what a crystal is supposed to be, right? Um, so these uh, things... Um, occupy a kind of weird space. And I will tell you the community had a lot of trouble um, accepting them and agreeing them. And first of all, even believing that they exist for a period of time. Um, but at the end of the day, they basically changed our definition of what a crystal is and what a crystal looks like. Um, and I'd like to go into that story in a little bit more detail because it's, it's very informative. And I think it has a lot of lessons um, for the uh, young scientists and engineers in the room. Um, and it started uh, when a fellow was looking at transmission electron microscope diffraction patterns. So this is uh, TEM diffraction pattern. Uh, and what that means is we're shining 
a beam of electrons through a very, very thin foil of metal. Uh, and so he was looking at rapidly quenched aluminum manganese uh, alloys. Uh, and, and he saw this diffraction pattern, which, you know, it seems like a nice periodic reciprocal lattice. So everything seems nice until we start counting the number of diffraction spots. And if we start here, I can call that one, two, and, and basically I'm, I'm, I'm looking for things, you know, I keep rotating around clockwise and I count these spots. So that one's going to be three, uh, four. If I keep rotating, I see five is here. Here I see six. Here I see seven. Here is number eight. Here is number nine. And here is number 10. Um, and then one more time and we're back to the beginning. And so this pattern was immediately troubling because this pattern itself, this diffraction pattern, had uh, a, a five-fold rotational axis through the center. And again, that's not supposed to happen. Um, and in fact, he was so surprised that he wrote down in his notebook, tenfold, question mark, question mark, question mark. Um, so this fellow's name was Danny Schechtman, um, and he didn't just stop there. He didn't say, oh, the machine's broken, or maybe I'm looking at a weird sample. Let's move on with my life. He, he was intrigued by it. Um, he tried to figure out what was happening. And so he looked at other materials. He looked at um, other um, approaches to trying to locate these things. Um, and it, 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 was, um, it, it became a labor of love for him, and he... Uh, you know, tried to publish these results. It took a couple of years for this even to get out in the community. People kept telling him, you know, you must be using the TEM wrong. You know, something is happening. We're not supposed to um, have uh, diffraction patterns that have fivefold um, rotational degrees of symmetry. Uh, and when his first paper came out, a lot of the community um, was taken aback by it. In fact, his research group leader at the time um, dropped off a diffraction textbook on his desk and said, um, you know, maybe you should read this because uh, there's not any validity in what you did. Um, and then a couple of days later, sort of in disinvited him from his research group um, because he didn't, he didn't believe uh, the results. Uh, but uh, Dr. Schechtman was not dismayed um, because he had done his work enough uh, that he, he believed what he was seeing. Uh, and other people were starting to reproduce the results as well. Um, now, that doesn't mean that everybody immediately rolled over and agreed. And in fact, there's one very famous person, uh, Linus Pauling, um, who, you know, uh, already had a Nobel Prize at that time. And so he thinks he's pretty important uh, and um, feels uh, that uh, it's okay to, you know, come, come along with a statement like, uh, there are no quasi-crystals, there are just quasi-scientists. Um, so, you know, there were a lot of haters out there, uh, and um, uh, in response, you can either sort of shut up and go away, or you can uh, stick to your guns. You can try and uh, provide additional evidence uh, and support your work. And th that's exactly what Dr. Sheckman did. Um, and other people were able to repeat the same observations. Um, and in the end, basically the community, the community, the International Union of Crystallographers, um, decided that they had to change the definition of what a crystal was. So a crystal is no longer something that has repeating periodic uh, translational order. A crystal is something uh, that results in a coherent, um, discrete diffraction pattern, like what we see or hear. Um, and so I think at the end of the day, Danny Sheckman uh, had the last laugh uh, when he got a Nobel Prize of his own um, to recognize this work. And so the important lesson here is that uh, you shouldn't be um, bossed around by people just because they have more uh, degrees and more hardware th than you. Um, you should pursue the truth wherever it lies. Uh, and you should always uh, make notes in your notebook and hold on to them uh, for many years so that when you do get your, your Nobel Prize, um, you can put copies of it on the internet for people like me to find. Um, so quasi-crystals, again, uh, they tend to be found in some of these rapidly quenched aluminum alloys. Um, and for a while, you know, again, people were sort of uncertain about them because they were these very manufactured things. They, they, there wasn't, you know, there didn't seem any hope that we could find these things naturally. Um, but again, people go looking and they found examples of some pretty bizarre minerals, including um, things that uh, were found in a natural meteorite. 
that again was very hot when it came through the atmosphere and uh, and quenched rapidly. And again, if you look in, uh, zoom in really uh, closely, you're going to see those uh, five-fold rotational patterns uh, in this case. Um, so quasi-crystals, again, they're built around this icosahedral symmetry. Um, you know, after it, it, it took a lot of work to figure out how to isolate and how to grow these things, and this whole thing itself is not particularly big, but it is a uh, microscopic um, quasi-crystal. Uh, and the shape is what we call an icosahedron. So we see a perfect pentagon uh, on this face. And in fact, all the faces are made up of pentagons. Um, so this is a good time to uh, pause and to refresh our um, uh, what we remember about point group symmetry and ask ourselves what rotational axes are present. Um, and how many are there of each kind? So not surprisingly, we're going to have a five-fold rotational axis down the center of each of these pentagons. Um, but you also find something coming out of this edge and something coming out of this corner. So if I were going to look down the corner, I could see that it actually has three-fold symmetry down the corner. Uh, and down the edge, it has two-fold rotational symmetry. Um, now we can count out uh, how many faces um, the thing has. So an icosahedron has 12 faces, and so that means it has 12 of these five-fold um, rotational axes. And if I want to know how many three-folds and how many two-folds, um, then there's a pretty simple way to do it. So let's think about the two-folds first. Um, we can ask, again, how many faces are there? There are 12 faces, and each face has five edges, one, two, three, four, five. Um, and so each of those has a two-fold um, rotational axis. But then we have to account for the fact that this axis is shared by this face as well as this face. So um, one edge is shared by how many faces? Two. Uh, and so the number of two-fold axes is simply uh, 12 times five divided by two. And that gives us 30 two-fold axes. Um, we can do the same thing for threefold axes. Again, there are 12 faces. Each face has five vertices. One, two, three, four, five. So five corners that have these threefold axes on them. But each vertice is, is shared by three faces. So again, one, two, three. And so if I were going to calculate the total number of threefold rotational axes, it should be 12 times five. <clears throat> divided by 3, <coughs> which gives us uh, 20 three-fold axes. Um, now, why icosahedrons? Well, uh, it turns out that if I think about um, spheres, uh, and particularly spheres that have roughly similar radii, uh, then the icosahedron is a, is a very efficient way to pack a whole bunch of spheres around one central sphere. Um, again, this is different from the hexagonal close packing or FCC um, close packing, um, but it is a very efficient packing structure. Um, and in fact, we see this in all kinds of uh, liquid uh, metals and in all kinds of amorphous uh, metals as well. Um, so when these, um, when these things are not in a crystal lattice, they tend to be packing in these icosahedral structures. Uh, and so what starts to happen in a quasi-crystal is that, you know, you have one cluster that is surrounded by another set of clusters that are surrounded by another set of clusters, and you build up this macroscopic icosahedron um, based on all of these uh, similarly shaped clusters. Um, so again, uh, the reason why quasi-crystals were so... Um, hard to find for such a long time is that they occupy a very particular space and, and we have to have a very particular kind of a, um, a cooling rate uh, to even observe them. So if we let our, uh, our metal cool too slowly, then the metal is going to tend to crystallize in a, you know, uh, a crystal lattice because um, that tends to be the lowest energy case. If we cool too rapidly, I'm sorry, I should have an axis down here. This is time, so temperature versus time. If I cool too rapidly, then the thing will be relatively jumbled and, and disordered, uh, and I'm going to end up with 
a metallic glass. But if I let the system cool at just the right rate, um, then these, these icosahedral clusters will start to pack around each other, uh, and they will begin to form, again, to form these quasi-crystals, um, rather than fully relaxing to this um, you know, three-dimensional crystalline lattice. Uh, that might be the lowest, the absolute minimum uh, in energy in the system at low temperatures. Um, so again, quasi-crystals, uh, they are a kind of crystal, even though they lack translational periodicity. Um, because the important thing that we uh, learn by them is that <coughs> we can have uh, or organized structures um, that result in diffraction patterns that are not, um, that don't have this translational symmetry. So that's gonna pretty much mark the end of our uh, foray into all these um, sort of weird and bizarre states. Uh, and I, I, I do want to emphasize that even though there are a lot of things that are you know, um, different from the basic amorphous versus crystalline materials that you might have uh, known or thought about before you entered, a lot of these things have a lot of practical application. Um, and you know, I'd be willing to bet a large sum of money that, that this map is not done yet. There are probably other states uh, of matter that we, we just haven't realized, we haven't explored. Um, and so it's up to you guys to think about what else is missing um, and how else might materials uh, end up surprising us in the long term. All right, uh, thank you for watching.